Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sausalito Books by the Bay and our wonderful event this evening. I'm Cheryl Pop, and I want to thank you for joining us for our virtual author event. We are delighted to be hosting two very accomplished writers who have mastered the art of historical fiction, which happens to be my favorite genre. So as you know, with um, a webinar, you, you can see us, we can't see you. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't bring you up on the screen at the end of the presentation. And we can also, uh, you can also submit questions throughout the conversation. You can go to your chat box or the Q&A box and you can um, submit a question, which we will go through near the end of this presentation. But I wanna start by, I think you all know what you're going to hear about today. You're gonna to hear a little bit about both of these authors' books that they've just written. Um, they both have two new books hot off the presses, but we're also going to hear from these two writers of historical fiction, fact versus fiction, getting it right when you're making it up. Um, Cause it's kind of historical fiction is a combination of both. So how do you blend the well-researched factual data about an event, an era uh, with a fictional tale and fictional characters? When and where can you take literary license? Those are all the sorts of things we're going to be discussing this evening. Um, Susanna Kearsley, is so brave. She's joining us from Canada where she's on the shores of Lake Ontario. It's nine o'clock at night for her. So thank you so much for making that sacrifice. Um, CG's here with us Fine. in Sausalito, yeah. but Susanna <laughs> Kearsley is a New York Times, USA Today, Globe and Mail bestselling author. She's also a former museum curator, which I think um, explains her love of restoring the lost voices of real people to the page, which is what she does in her books. Um, her award-winning novels, there are 14 of them all together, um, have been published and translated in more than 25 countries. So it's quite an accomplishment. Uh, Vanished Days is her most recent book. It just published, hold it up, there we go. Um, I think it popped October 5th, maybe the second, yeah. I can't remember, but congratulations. It Thank is you. the her newest historical tale of intrigue, romance, and revolution. It is set in the, on the cusp of the 18th century, the um, early 1700s in Scotland, which at that period of time, well, the exile of King James brought about huge political and religious turmoil. And um, it's all, it's all set in that incredibly fascinating era. CG is also a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. She's a former Emmy award-winning television producer, and um, she's penned 13 books of historical and contemporary fiction, the latest of which is A Spy Above the Clouds. It's the second in her Spy Sister series, and they're about heroic American women who served as secret agents um, helping the allies in Nazi occupied France during World War II. So it just published in September. So thanks to both of you for joining this evening. Um, let's dive right in. <laughs> both of you um, are best selling authors with a huge portfolio of historical fiction. Um, what are your personal guidelines that you would offer to other writers as authors? What are your guidelines for writing about fiction that's also historical? Do you want to start, Susan? Who's going to go first? <laughs> oh, gosh, that, that's always a thing, right? Who gets to go first? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I want to thank CG. Uh, whose idea this entire evening was because you know CG and I are always looking for ways to do things together. We um, we've had a lot we, of fun in New Orleans. <laughs> we had a lot of fun in New Orleans. It's a whole nother story. Um, but you know we haven't ever ever had a chance to do an event together. So this is our first event together, and I'm really looking forward to. I really was looking forward to this. And thank you, Cheryl, for for hosting. Um, I really wish I was there in person. Um, but I'm I'm just so thrilled that we're able to do this. And thank you, everybody joining us. Um, the personal guidelines, gosh, that's a tough one because the, the one thing about writing and the one thing I'm sure there are some people watching who, who write and who, who want to, uh, write more, 
um, or explore their own writing. The thing about writing is there's no wrong way to do it. Every writer finds their own path into writing um, and their own their own technique for doing it. So you'll you'll probably find as as CG and I talk that we each have our own approaches and our own way of doing it. And there is no wrong way. One way is not better than the other. It's just whatever works for that individual writer. Um, when I approach historical topics and historical fiction, I just, um, I always use almost the, the legal best evidence rule. Um, I go back, best evidence is a, it's, it's a legal rule that says that if there is, if there is an original document existing that you should always start try to seek that one out. That's your best evidence to, to, um, to use and, and as opposed to a copy. And it you know goes back to the days when, when if you were to come into court with a handwritten copy of something, if there was an original that you could produce, you should produce the original and not the handwritten copy. The, hand, the original was the best evidence. So I'm a big best evidence person and I always try to go back to the primary documents whenever I can. So if I'm reading uh, what a historian has written about a particular era, I will flip to the historian's bibliography and I will look for the documents and, and sources that that historian used. And I will use that to get back as far as I can to the primary documents that exist and use the best evidence that I can when I'm, when I'm doing. I don't want someone else's filtered um, version of what happened. I want to get back as far as I can to the unfiltered version with the understanding that even that unfiltered version is gonna contain a lot of biases because you, know, you could, well, you know, current times are a very good example, but you could, you could look at one event and ask six different people what is actually happening. And you're gonna get six different answers depending on that person's political views, that person's upbringing, where they were when they, you know, what they saw, where they were, um, you know, where they happen to come from, what country they're from. And, and I, I had a really, really good professor at university who, was teaching us the Cuban Missile Crisis and threw a whole pile of books in the middle of the table that were from different countries, you know, including Russia, including, you know, countries that weren't even involved in the crisis and said, now read all that somewhere in the middle of that is what actually happened. And <laughs> that, that made a huge impression on me. And I, so I try to always get back to the best evidence that I can. It's my, that's my rule. Well, C I, CG, do you have rules? I do too. And it's interesting. I have some other rules, which I'll, I'll do briefly, but, um, just coming on what Susanna said, uh, I wrote a book once about, um, based on the life of a real Duchess of Gordon, the fourth Duchess of Gordon. She was an 18th century figure and she was known as the matchmaking Duchess because all the lore said all she wanted to do was marry her kids off to dukes, which she managed to do. And that she was a heartless mother and didn't give a darn, just marry him, marry him. When I got to the National Archive in Scotland, uh, I managed to, uh, sort of talk my way in there because I don't have a PhD, but I had a readership at the Huntington Library in California. So I had this card. So they, so when I went and I said, we'd like to see what you have on Jane Maxwell, the Duchess of Gordon. And they, oh, yes, Dr. Ware. You know, I, I did not disabuse them of that fact. Anyway, about an hour later, this little old man comes out pushing a cart in a white sort of lab coat. And he says, well, Lassie, I don't know what you'll be wanting this for, but no one's looked at this stuff for a hundred years. So I, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of letters and inventories from the estate of the, the Dukes of Gordon. And I'm piling through and I find this cache of letters from the Duchess of Gordon to her children, various children, the most kind, concerned, sweet, completely opposite of every written biography about her you could find. She was worried about one child dying of the flu, Agu. She was worried about another one making a bad match with someone who would not be um, kind to her. I mean, so it just, it was exactly what Suzanne is saying. The best evidence is the one that goes back the farthest. And we can't always get to that. But the other rule I have is don't put anything in an historical novel you know to be untrue. Right. And when fudging dates, sometimes you have to fudge a few things for, as they say, dramatic purposes. You just, the thing that answers that is to disclose that in the author's note 
Uh, I had a thing in the in the new book, uh, um, Spy Above the Clouds, where Alan Dulles, who was founder of the CIA, basically, and who was a snake in my view, um, he did not get to Bern, Switzerland as a spy master until the fall of, uh, of a certain year. And I had to have him there in June. So I put him there in June, but in my author's note, I disclose. I disclose. And the other guideline I have is fact check the Dickens. I come from a background as a broadcaster and a reporter. And you know, in the olden days, we couldn't say anything without three sources. So fact checking the Dickens out of everything you write as an historical novelist is so important. And I always find things, I don't know about you, Susanna, at the last minute I go, oh, you yeah. know what? I gotta, I gotta look, I gotta look that up. And of course I had it wrong. And I saved myself literally by the Google machine at the last possible minute. There will always be something. There yeah. will always be something that, yeah. you know, that is, that is, but, but yeah, taking it back to the, not just the original sources, but taking it back to the people themselves, getting away from the, the way that they have the been opinion. portrayed by historians. Yeah. Um, when, in, when I wrote The Firebird, it was, it was set in, in Russia in Peter the Great's time, just actually just after Peter the Great had, had passed. And everybody has opinions on, on Peter the Great's widow, the, the first Empress Catherine, not okay. Catherine the Great, but the first Empress Catherine. And those opinions were mostly written by male historians at the time, and they, they would portray her in a certain way. And they would, you know, people were always saying things like, oh, she wasn't a very efficient ruler. She wasn't a very effective ruler. She didn't do this and she didn't do that in the first couple of months of her reign. And you're like, well, you know, guys, hang on a second. She had just lost her husband, you know, unexpectedly. And, and at the same time that she had just lost her husband, she had also lost a child, like just before her husband. The, the funeral of Peter the Great was concurrent at the same time with the funeral of one of their children, the little coffin followed the, the big coffin across yeah. the ice. And, you know, that's enough to, to do a number on any woman, let alone someone who is as deeply in love with her husband as Catherine was with Peter. So for a male historian to sit there and go, yeah, she wasn't signing a whole lot of bills or anything yeah. in that first couple of months, it shows a, a, a tremendous lack of empathy and understanding mm -hmm. of humans, you know? And, and so you have to kind of, get away from that and look at the people. So well, you, so you did, oh, go I was on. just gonna say, I, I propose this, and especially, I think both um, Susanna and I have specialized in asking the question, what were the women doing? Yeah. What were the women doing in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century? And you really find the bias in the written biographies and, uh, and, the, and the sort of written record about women. And I mean, any woman who was out there being a painter uh, as Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun or uh, a politician or a musician or a writer or whatever they were doing, which was unusual for that period and even into the 20th, mm -hmm. 20th century, you're gonna get terrible bias when you're just reading mm -hmm. secondary sources. So that so, is really a pit you have to not fall into. And that begs my next question. Um, because you're talking about the importance of historical accuracy and how critical it is to do this research. But what I'm hearing is you, you do fudge a little bit because you're not going to write, you're not going to give this true life person necessarily the demeanor and the character that men have written about her. You're going to portray her a little differently, which is kind of deviating from historical record. So the question is, um, you know, Susanna has a great uh, piece at the end of her most recent book that I read. It's called A Word About Accuracy. And you say, I love this, sometimes you need to be inaccurate to seem accurate. Um, but at the That's same time- That's my favorite quote in that whole essay. Yeah, so, but at the same time, you know, you don't want to distort facts to confuse readers. Nope. And nope. sometimes I think it is okay to fudge, yeah? Well, I don't, I, it, that's not about fudging. That's, um, that's about using like the Scots use dollars as their currency at the time that I'm writing about. And mm -hmm. Scots say, even to this day, will use the word gotten um, in speech and stuff. But if you put that in the books, every English 
reader will say, oh, that's an Americanism. You know, you can't have your Scottish historical people spending dollars because that never happened. And then what you end up having to do is answer like a, a boatload of reader mail with the same thing. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Here's something, you know, it, so it just becomes so much easier to just use one of the other currencies that they use, maybe not as commonly as dollars. So I went with the Merck instead of the dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just so much easier than trying mm -hmm. to explain to people, yes, they actually did use dollars. But then see, that's what, my point at the end is that the author's note in historical novels, they, it really has to be there because yeah. you explain that and you said to be, to sound accurate, I had to be inaccurate, but here's yep. what it really was. Here's what they actually it. said. Yeah. And it's over yeah. and you don't get a thousand yeah. mail. <laughs> but in terms of portraying women, um, I would argue it's the other way around. The male historians have inaccurately portrayed women. And what I'm trying mm -hmm. to do is put that back to the, the accurate view of the women. If you go back mm -hmm. to the primary sources, it shows the women as they actually were. As they were. If, okay. if you go back to the primary sources, especially, and even letters um, from, you know, from men between men, you will see how they had the relationships with their wives, with their daughters, with the, the other thing. And, and, but historians through the, the centuries, depending on, you know, especially a lot of Victorian historians, which is where a lot of our history comes from. Thank you, Mr. Macaulay. Um, a lot of historians shaped women of the past in a certain way and attributed certain motives to women of the past. Um, and any relationship between a, a powerful woman and a man in their view had to be based on sex and, and you know, deviousness and stuff and not intelligence or, or anything. But when you go back to the real actual document, you get a different view of the woman, you get mm. the actual woman who was. So putting her back on the page in the way that she actually was, is correcting the error. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not rewriting the past. Mm -hmm. um, in the yeah. same way as putting, um, you know, putting gay people back in the page, putting transgender people back in the page. I mean, they existed there. and you find them everywhere. You find mm -hmm. them all over the place, but they mm -hmm. were just written out or put in a different light, mm -hmm. you know. Um, there were an awful lot of people, you know, cross-dressing and wearing odd clothing and living their lives as the opposite sex and mm. stuff like that and it's kind of you hit a certain point where it's like you know th those are actually transgender people yeah. living we just didn't you know historians didn't know what to call yeah. them yeah so. and 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 as far as women are concerned um i think you both have done an excellent job of kind of rewriting history if you will and portraying um a lot of correcting heroic women Correct. Yes, correcting, <laughs> rewriting, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, you are not necessarily changing the facts and figures about events or historical yeah. data, but you're putting a different blush on these characters and yeah. particularly women. So I applaud you both for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your research because yeah. it's so important in historical fiction. And um, I know CG has written about Scotland also, but more recently about World War II, and that's gotten a little bit easier because they opened up the archives. I don't know, when was it, 1995 or whatever, and a lot more information came out. And we've just been recording things more in the 19th and 20th centuries than they did in the 16th and 17th. So this is for you, Susanna, really. Um, were you a scholar of, um, I mean, I know you worked as a museum curator, but yeah. were you a scholar of Scottish, English, uh, history or because there's a lot in that book and did it just take you forever to do this research was it easy to find accessible no I love I love research I love my rabbit holes and I I just am like a I'm like a little terrier when I get get the sense <laughs> my husband of says something, a dog you know. with a bone <laughs> yeah and I I just I go huh that's something interesting and I just I I I was born into a family of genealogists, amateur genealogists. So I love, I'm very accustomed to sitting in archives and looking for that really elusive fact. And, um, you know, the smell of dusty paper is one of my, one of my loves. Um, and that's probably part of what drove me into museum work in the first place. So the, but the, the thing of museum work is, is just, you know, it did teach me the whole aspect of curation of the fact that some things are, you know, some things are kept in the storeroom, some things are out front. And, you know, so I, I'm always looking for what's in the back room and the, um, but no, I was not a, I was not a, a 
a history major. I studied politics, which comes into everything. And people will see that in my books a lot that I, you know, it, it's everything is political. But there, but I love the interplay of, um, of politics and how it touches all our lives. And um, I studied international development. So I'm also very interested in the, the haves and the have nots and the, the that sort of thing. Um, but also, I just love history. I just flat out love history. And I love people. I'm fascinated, endlessly fascinated by people. And when I uncovered these people and their interactions, um, you know, for me, it's, it's all about the people. My favorite historical novel quote um, and I've actually, I've got it, I've got it here in my room. It's, it's by, you've probably heard that, I'm sure CG's heard this. Um, it's the Will and Ariel Durant one about civilize, the, the story of civilization. Remember that, I've got it back here somewhere, the entire story of civilization series. Um, but they said, civilization is a stream with banks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing things historians usually record. While on the banks, unnoticed, people build homes, make love, raise children, sing songs, write poetry, and even whittle statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happened on the banks. And I'm always interested in the little people, the, the people that are living their lives on the banks that didn't make it into the history books, mm -hmm. or that just sort of, you catch a glimpse of them in the history books mm -hmm. because the historians didn't think they were important enough to put in. So. That's that's wonderful. And, you know, I am, I am not a uh, Scottish scholar, so I wouldn't know if what you wrote was true or not. Um, <laughs> but, but, you have to but trust it, me but, but it, yeah, but it, but it worked. And um, it's daunting. I think the whole yeah. research thing is daunting. And I know having done some research with CG, my good friend here in Sausalito, um, on a couple of her books, it's so important to be accurate. Well, yeah. if I, you know, this is the table they were sitting and this is the window and we can't just make this up. It has to have, it has to work. It has to be real. CG, do you want to talk well, a little bit yeah, about the, the thing daunting is, research process? Well, we, you know, Suzanne and I come to the same conclusions from very different angles. I was a reporter for 23 years. I was a health reporter. I was a, a women's issues reporter and all of that. Um, and I was coming out of an era which is very different than it is now. It, it wasn't so celebrity driven. It was just, you know, you were a regular reporter and you had to have three uh, sources for everything you ever said. And there were certain rules of the game. And I was a history major in the wrong century. I was a Renaissance Italian history major in college. Why? Don't even ask. I should have been 18th century British American history, but I got misled by a bad dean. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I, I loved history. That I did. But as a, as a reporter, there are certain rules of the game, which is who, what, where, why, when. And I was always interested in sort of the people on the banks, the women that weren't forward. I mean, in World War II, the reason I got interested in the American secret agents who worked for the British was that there were only six of them that I found and very few until this most recent woman, um, Virginia Hall, who had a wonderful nonfiction book called A Woman of No Importance. And now there's a new novel about her, The Invisible Woman. None of these women were known. And as Cheryl mentioned, the archives uh, on, were starting to be opened around the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, which was 1995. Um, and it's so interesting because you can, as you say, you can never peel the onion enough. I read several autobiographies by these women secret agents, but they had to say major X and, you know, yep. so and so why, because they were under the Secrets Act yep. when they published in 1977. So then after I read their book, I had to go find out, well, who was major X, you know? So th the fact is that a reporter's skills uh, of who, what, where, why, when, how much, how bad, those same skills um, as with a curator can be used to find out as best you can what transpired. And the people that always have drawn me were the women who did amazing things and weren't 
recognized yep. or yep. if they were at their own era like playwrights i wrote a whole book about playwrights uh at covent garden and drury lane thanks to david garrick who was a feminist i believe who published and produced these women they got lost because guess who did the anthologies at the end of the 18th century a guy and he never included Daphne de Mo yep. de DeFore's sister, who was a huge playwright, you know, or Elizabeth Inchbald, who died with 6,000 pounds to her name in the 18th century. So we realize that we are have our filter through the filter of whoever was the last person to sum up the century. And so the interesting thing has been using those skills of a reporter to find out what was the story, even if it happened 200 years before. And it's been so exciting to realize that it's all a funnel and all goes into your book, no matter what the heck you did before you started writing. Yeah. You know, let's go back to the very start. And when you're plotting a novel, a historical, a, a novel with a, of historical fiction, um, what drives it? Is it the, the, the history? And then you add the imagined characters, you know, how... What's real? What's fictionalized? When you're just plotting, when you're starting this, what what typically drives it? Is it a historical event? Is it this unsung heroine that you've just learned about, um, or do you first have sort of a this would be an interesting plot, and now I'm going to wrap history around it? I think it's different for every book. I think every every book has its own its own seed that is the the, the genesis of it. For me. Um, it's, I mean, I can only give you for each individual, each individual <laughs> book started with a different thing. Um, but it's, I don't plot for one thing. I'm really, I'm bad at plotting. Um, I'm a, I'm a pantser. Which, I'm the opposite. This sorry. is good. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, yeah. This is good. Okay. This will be good for everybody. <laughs> Tell to me see. about it. I want to know how you do okay. it. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know how I do it. I only know that if I try to plot, I kill the story. And I have tried to plot so many times. Um, because I'm an engineer's daughter and I, I love lists. I love maps. I love, I love everything to be orderly. And, and the idea that I, you know, I can't, I can't get the plot of a book to like sit in, you know, it, but the minute I try to do that, the story just dies. Um, so what I do do is I make a, a, a timeline. I have this, and I was going to print out a a thing of my timeline to show people what it looks like but as I'm going through all the the it's pages and pages and pages hundreds of pages of timeline so it's a it's a ever-growing document on my computer now that will be just by day you know by by day and year um and if I find something in a letter or a document that you know it can be something as small as somebody mentioning it's raining or you know that the that they were mustering men on the common that day or something like that and i'll plunk that into the timeline because it might it might be useful i don't know whether it's going to be useful or not but if somebody mentions something specific going on on a day or at a particular time i'll put it in the timeline so my timeline becomes this big giant unwieldy thing um and if i <laughs> If I have, uh, you know, little snippets and bits out of books, I'll, I'll you know, if, especially if I'm reading them online, I will just, you know, screen grab them and toss them into the timeline too, because I never know where my characters are gonna wanna build a scene. But if my characters then decide they're going to build a scene on October 7th, 1707, I can go, ha ha, let me just go to October 7th, 1707 in my timeline and we'll see what, what was the weather like and who was where, and you know, where was Robin Murray that day and who was doing this and who was doing what. And I've got the, the elements I need to, to kind of craft what I need to craft. So that's as close as I get to, to plotting as I know where everybody was, but I can actually, sometimes I can see these things and it's like, man, that'd be a really cool scene because look where everybody is. Look, they're doing these really, really amazing mm -hmm. things and it's really dramatic. And it's like, look, characters, look, look at this day. Everybody is exactly, like, look, look, we have ships. We have all this stuff happening. They're like, yeah, no, we're not going to do anything. Then we're just going to go right over here and do this. So for me, what happens is I stumble on a little incident or some aspect of history that I didn't know anything about. And I'll just go, huh, I didn't, know that and I want to know more about it and 
as I learn about it, things start attaching. I don't know if this happens for CG too, but things start, it, you don't forget that particular incident and it lives with you and you just kind of go and it grows and grows. And now what happens is a book idea will grow out of the research for the one before it. So a character just doesn't stop moving off to the side and you're like, oh, okay, well, they want their own book or they want to do this. And, and it just sort of all swirls around and I keep putting more and more things on until I get the first sentence. So when I get the first sentence, then I know I've got a book, but that's how my process works. And CG, you do outline. Um, I do, but, 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 I what, but what drives it, the, the fiction or the history? Um, it's, as she says, it depends on the book. It's mm -hmm. often a person, you know, for yep. me. Yep. Uh, and I, I disagree. I think a timeline is an outline, sorry. <laughs> Well, no, it's not, but it's not, no, because it's, 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 the timeline is from the research. The timeline yeah, no, is not, because there's but no I, story involved. There's no, uh, like, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the apples were ready. Yeah. You well, know. mine is a little bit different in the sense I do a timeline too, but once, you know, once I get the nub and I mean, I, a great example of the first book in my series, Landing by Moonlight, um, we go to this area in France because of my husband and I'd been going for 20 years, walking by all the um, monuments about the resistance and not really having good enough French to you know, really understand what it said. And a French friend of mine took me to a tiny little chalet homemade museum for the resistance. And she said, you have to see this. And I walked in there and there were literally pictures thumbtacked you as a museum curator you would have been horrified just it was really a homemade museum of the locals who put together what still existed about the the resistance in the high alps in haute and on the on the on these boards were these pictures of these women in british uniforms and one said odette samson churchill and she said um captured tortured at Ravensbrook, survived, obviously married a Churchill. And that just went bing. And I found it, of yep. course, she was very yep. well known. There were a lot of books written about her. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna do that. But it was so fascinating. I thought, I wonder if there were any Americans. And it's yep. when like, my reporter instinct is to ask, I'm curious. I'm curious, I ask a question. And of course, then I dove in and I found these women that were virtually no one had ever heard of. And then I had to sort of say, okay, well, what's the story? And I'm, I'm the daughter of a writer and the niece of two writers and the granddaughter of writers. It's sort of our thing in our family. And for me, it was always story also, story. Yeah. What's yeah. the story? What is it that makes you say, wow, I didn't know that. Or, wow, that is really amazing. When I get that, oh my God, I didn't know there were American women working for the British before America even joined World War II, before Pearl Harbor. So that led me you know, into saying, okay, were they there? When I found that they were there, then I picked the, the basic lives of three women that I was gonna fictionalize uh, because it was easier to move them around, it, you know, as you know, especially World War II, it's like yep. confusing. So yep. then I got my timeline of every single thing that happened every day in World War II from 1938 before war was declared, 39, all the way through 47, really. And once I had that and I knew about the woman I was going to write about, even though I was going to fictionalize her, I got all of her information that I could get. And it's then I actually outline a story but you know I think for me I need a blueprint I know what's my assignment when it's like being a reporter I know what is the assignment desk going to make me do today you know and I feel it's my uh it's my security blanket right. to have a sense now often I will get into it and I'll say that isn't going to work you know or something new will come into my awareness and i go oh story's going zig it was not it's not going zag so they're kind of they're similar processes um but i think that um for me i have to hang it at least even if it's wrong i have to hang it on something to have the courage to get to work every day and I, and it really helps me. So as you said, there's no one right way to do nope. anything. No. Nope. And every and every book is kind of different. I mean, yeah, there were books, book there were totally books that I 
there were books that I didn't do a timeline for. I mean, I think I probably started, I can't remember where I started timelining, maybe with Winter Sea, because that was probably the first one that, that where the history became so important, so like, you know, where I had yeah. to, you know, I, I, I started losing track of where, you know, when did this happen and when did that happen? And my characters were kind of sitting there waiting for me to figure stuff out. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, like, I'll just, I'll just start putting things here because I, I didn't want to have those constant delays while they figured, you know, they waited for me to find out stuff. Right. But, or sometimes um, you have this story and you don't know the background well enough, you know, so I, I you know, I'll I say, oh my gosh, this is a fabulous story about this woman playwright, you yep. know, who did all this stuff. But I don't know a thing about 18th century theater, you know, I have to stop oh. and learn it all and then yep. put it in some sort of organized way. But it's the thing that keeps us going, I think, Cheryl, <laughs> It's that there's always another story and there's always more to learn. And I but, think you have to have that thirst for learning something new yeah, to me. That's anyway. the, the thing is that you always, you always trip down new rabbit holes when you're doing the research for the one you're doing, right? Like you always, you, you'll, for me, when I can't see what I'm writing about, like a, that's when I have to stop and do more research, right? Like I'll be doing, I'll be walking down with my character because I see it like a film so my character will be walking down a certain street and then I can't see what he's looking at so I'm like okay fine time to stop and, and do a little deep dive into the punch market and leave and see what was there and, and you know go back and take a look at stuff and then I can write that scene better well as I'm going through that then I might discover something else that I never knew about that you know leads me off in this other direction and before I know it I'm doing like you know market days and this and that, and that. all these other things that I you know had no idea I was going to need to know and half of it doesn't make it into the book anyway the reader the reader has no idea like my books are like you know chunkers to start off with like they the stuff that the stuff that you take out of the book or that you don't put into the book because you think, well, that's fascinating that the reader, you know, like I, I know my readers are already like tapping out going too much, too much, too much, too much. Like there's too much in here. Um, you yeah. know, and, and I take a lot of the history out that I put in to the book because I get very enthusiastic about it. I get very enthusiastic about putting stuff in and I have to look at it and go, yeah, no reader is going to even care about this. Let's let's well, you know the out. great line, the, the great line that said, kill your little darlings. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I had the I, I had just a funny thing that happened over the years on the first book I ever wrote. It, the woman who bought it was just wonderful. Her name is Beverly Lewis. She's since mm -hmm. passed away. And Beverly Lewis called me up and said, Miss Ware, you know, I never met her. We are honored to be able to buy your book island of the swans i absolutely love it and i'm going to really love it fifty thousand words shorter <laughs> now fifty thousand words for all of us who write knows that that's the length of a mystery novel that's a book, that's a book. <laughs> and she said and she said all right do you want to cut it or should i and i had just got my first computer and i said oh i'll, I'll cut it and because i'd been a reporter i was so used to being yelled at to cut my script to cut it that i didn't take offense and she was astounded you know she said afterwards she said i thought you'd slam the phone down on me i said oh no editors are always yelling at me it's fine <laughs> i'm good you know it's fine well anyway at the end of the book i had this great faculty that mary queen of scots played golf two days after her husband was murdered Lord yep. Darnley. and I just thought that was and Mary Queen Scots had nothing to do with what I was writing about but I just love that so much so I stuck it in she took it out I put it back in she took it out I it ended up in the first version second edition I didn't pay any attention someone else took it out <laughs> third edition I put it back in you know we get in love with our little factoids that mm -hmm. we think are just absolutely fascinating. And I mm -hmm. still think that one's fascinating. Well, sometimes but, I leave them in. Sometimes I just leave them in because I figure, you know, if I like it, someone else is going to like it. What yeah, the heck? That was my feeling. The story, my the story never wanted believed. it. And, and my favorite moment is when a reader will write to me and say, you know, I found that part fascinating. And then I feel like going to be ever going, ha! You know, <laughs> like, as, you know, that part that you fought me about leaving in, ha! Somebody look, this one fan, this one reader really liked it. Great. All, the other, like it. all the other readers are probably skipping over it going, boring, boring, boring. You know, but everybody it just takes one other person besides me to love it, to justify that. You know, just... Ladies, let's talk about characters, um, fictional versus real life characters. Mm -hmm. um, your books, um, I'm more familiar with CGs. I've just read your one, but I'm going to read more of them now, Susanna. You have to, um, right. You know, um, 
in A Spy Above the Clouds, Constant Vivier Clark, Viv, is I think based on a real life American spy who CG research. You've got Lily and Adam in Vanished Days, Susanna, mm -hmm. and they're make-believe characters, I yep. think, but James Graham did exist and yep. he's in there. And how, how often, why, and when do you include real live historical figures versus make-believe figures? And um, are the real figures the stars or are the fictional characters usually the stars of the book? Again, it depends on the book. Um, I've written books where the real life characters are like off to the fringes and, you know, barely mentioned at all. Um, and everybody's fictional pretty much. Um, and I've written books where the real life characters are almost at the core of the story. Um, in my book, The Winter Sea, the historical hero is a real life character, John Murray. Um, who you will have read about in the vanished days because everybody's looking for him. Um, he's Robin's uh, younger brother. Um, but uh, sometimes like that just, it, it again, it's just what this story, you know, what happens with the story. The story demands this or that. They're not usually, I don't usually put um, really illustrious real life characters at the heart of a story. If, if, if we meet them at all, we're gonna meet them Briefly. briefly yeah like briefly yeah. um yeah. i have put the empress catherine in i have put king james the eighth bonnie prince charlie's dad because i really like him so i slipped him in um to uh one of my books um but um again i have to you know i i, I tend to use i tend to make the more often than not the the real life people are peripheral to the the central characters of the book, just because as CG says, you have more, more freedom in how you move your fictional characters than you do with your real life characters if you're sticking to the facts and the history. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler for, for where my characters are gonna go. And um, you know, if, if they weren't in a certain place at a certain time, it can kind of mess up your, your timing for your book. You have to spend a lot of time sitting around waiting for them to show up in a certain place. Um, or find a way for your characters to to kill time waiting for them to show up um, because I don't I don't mess that much with my with my timeline. Um, yeah, I don't either, and I think that's true. I the reason I made the decision um, the real woman, for instance, and a spy above the clouds is a woman named um, Devereaux Rochester Reynolds, and I made her Vivier. Uh, Clark, you know, so her name was Dev and my character's name is Viv. And I mean, she absolutely is this woman, but I, I needed to be able to move her around in yep. a dramatic fashion. So I, I made that decision, but you know, you can't make Winston Churchill a skinny guy and no. you can't make Hitler good looking. I mean, once you have the real characters, which I did, they were periphery as well. I find that's just easier. Um, they, they come in and out. I mean, I did one with, uh, about the playwrights where Boswell came in and out, you know, uh, but it's just easier to deal with so that you're never inaccurate if you possibly can help it about real and very well-known people. Um, I And mine, of course, I had Hans Kiefer, who was this horrible Nazi at uh, 84 Avenue Foch, who tortured people and this beautiful Beaux-Arts building in Paris, you know, behind the walls was just grim and horrible. Um, and he is a, a historical figure, but as I say in my acknowledgement, he's an historical figure portrayed fictionally, you know, which mm -hmm. lets you mm -hmm. out of the bag, but I never did anything. I never put him in the building when he wasn't there. You know, right. I follow the rules. Um, but it's just a lot harder because if you care about not misleading people, um, you want to keep those characters uh, uh, as real and true to life as you can possibly make it. But in the character of, of my spy, every big event that happens in the book, she did. I mean, she yep. confronted people and, and, and got people, you know, bluffed her way out of prison. I mean, she did all this stuff. All those events are real. But just in the way of structuring the story, it made it just, it was a decision you have to make in the beginning, you know? And yet in the Duchess of Gordon, 
I portrayed her as herself and tried to keep, because there was a lot about her that I found over four years of research. It took me four and a half years to get that book out. Uh, it was before the Google machine, which has made life a lot easier in some ways for us to check facts quickly. But, you know, she was a character from soup to nuts who was based on a real life of a real woman who really walked on the earth. So you're right. It just depends on the book. You make these kind of basic decisions, structural, character, all the things that go into a book, um, depending on what the book is and what the story is. And the information you have at the time. I mean, when I was writing The Winter Sea, I had I had some information from about John Murray. I had some of his letters. I had some of the information from, uh, you know, family members who knew him like at the time and, and that sort of thing. And then the book comes out, the book gets published several years later. I actually make contact with his, you know, his brother's descendants who provide me with more information. And not only do I get to see a portrait of him, but I get to, I get to uh, access other family documents that give me other details that had I known them at the time, I would have definitely put them in yeah. the book. I mean, there's some really cool anecdotes there and stuff that I wish I had known. And, and, you know, but you can't go back and insert those in a book that's already written, right? So you have mm -hmm. to kind of save those and find a way to work them in later for something else. So you can only do the best with what you have at the time. Yeah. I have a couple more questions about the craft of writing historical fiction. Uh, and then I'd like you both to speak about your books and then we'll take questions from our guests and attendees. And I'm gonna so, plug in a light, is that okay? okay of course. I'll yes, be right go back. plug in a light. Of course. And I'll just remind it's everybody here. <laughs> I'll remind everyone who's on the call that um, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will get to those um, close to the top of the hour here. Um, this probably is a little interest to you, Susanna, but there is a huge baseball pennant playoff tonight. Ooh. The Giants, the San Francisco Giants and the dreaded LA Dodgers are uh, playing, I think, um, I think as we speak, but I want to assure everybody that uh, who's local that we will be off of this in time for you to catch <laughs> the, the balance of the game. Okay. No, right. And if you get, jump out early, you'll it get will to be see on the, YouTube later, right? You'll get, <laughs> to, you'll get to see the end. So anyway, one of my last questions about the craft of, of historical fiction writing is, and I think I know the answer to this, it's probably different with every book, but is there a standard model or template for how much is fiction and how much is history? Um, is there one formula that works better than another or does it just really depend on the story? No, it really depends on the story. Yeah. I, I, don't I don't think there's a template for anything. I think, it, and every book is different and every story is different. It's whatever works for every story. Don't you think, CJ? Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I, like Island of the Swans, which is about the Duchess of Gordon, it was 99% about her. Um, on other books that I've written, there was a nub of an idea based, you know, and it ended up totally of my imagination, pretty much, but rooted in mm -hmm. history and rooted in the time. But still, it was, you know, me fantasizing yeah. about a subject. So uh, it, it, every book is different. Yeah, I think it is. I know, really, historical fiction is my favorite genre, but I do feel it's important that my favorite historical fiction books kind of balance the storytelling with the history so that it doesn't get too over, over the history doesn't get too yeah. overwhelming yeah. you yeah. know you want it to still be a page turner and i mean you tackled <laughs> susanna such a tumultuous time in scottish history i mean so many religions so much unrest so many politics so many players and um there was no separation of church and state in those days. I mean, no, there it's was insane. Not. No. And, and what you both have done in these books to help is you often do, you know, uh, genealogical charts at the beginning or the end. <laughs> and I swear, I go back to those because I'm like, wait a minute, you know, Moray, Mornay, how, how do they fit in? How does that work? So um, I applaud you both for doing that well because it's, it's, not, it's not easy when you're dealing with a hugely historical time like that era. And you Scotland. have to remember, you know, you, you, the writer, CG and Susanna, we're fascinated by history and we love all the mm -hmm. weird little squirrely details. Um, and I always have to keep in mind, you know, maybe my reader isn't as, you know, whacked as I am about history. So I try to do that kind of guidepost thing too. I mean, I've had genealogy charts in the front and the mm -hmm. last two I did maps because 
two of my beta readers who knew the area in the high Alps in the Haute Savoie very well said, look, most people never get to this part of France. You need to put in a map that shows where was the Plateau de Glière battle and where did Viv have her little chalet and how far away is Geneva over the border to sneak people out of France, you know? And I think it just helps the reader. First of all, because we're not in America teaching history much. I mean, it's a big bugaboo of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, people, honestly, you ask them, you know, uh, who was the third president of the United States, they couldn't tell you. So I mean, I think that, you know, part of my mission is, yeah, is a kind of education, but the other trick is not to overwhelm what should be an engaging, entertaining story with so much history that the reader just gets bogged down and they give up or they don't like it. And, and so, and I find, I don't know about you, Susanna, over the years, I have to really watch it to get that balance because yep. I think social media has really impacted people's attention span, their ability mm -hmm. to stick. I mean, I think mm -hmm. older readers tend to be used to reading doorstoppers like we have written, mm -hmm. you know, big, thick books. Um, but I find now that I'm really searching for a balance that is a good story that keeps you page turning the pages, but also mm -hmm. gives you those, gee, I didn't know that fact <laughs> woven in and the weaving is the art and it's hard. The weaving of deciding when and what and how much to weave into the piece so that it it's it's a seamless fact in fiction. And that's I have, the trick. I have a lot of younger readers, which I, I love. I absolutely love that. And the so I, I haven't noticed I haven't noticed a, a lack of attention on the part of my younger readers. I find that they're able to keep up with the history just fine. I find that it, you know, if if I lose them, it's I take it as my failing that I I didn't put it clearly enough because yeah. the, the author's job is to communicate. The author's job is to be clear. And um, the what I try to do is I try to think, is this the right place for me to tell this, to drop this part of the history? Are they going to remember it when they need to remember it? Right. And there's that little rule of thumb that you sort of, you know, you sort of have to sometimes repeat something a few times, like two or three times before someone actually gets yes, it. it. Exactly. Um, you know, and when is the most natural time for, you know, if I'm going to be introducing the idea of Jacobites to someone who has no idea, you cannot assume that everybody knows what Jacobites Now, thanks to Diana Gabaldon, a lot of people know what Jacobites are now. Thank you, Diana. Um, but, you know, not everybody does. And I had to know, look so, up how to pronounce it just to be yeah. sure. And, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that, that uh, you just have to, you have to drop the things properly and you can't put it too early and expect the reader to still remember it like 20 chapters right. later when you want them to. So you have to kind of make sure that you're you're calling back to things all the time. And this is one thing, it's funny because occasionally an editor will say, you're repeating this, you said that before. And I'm like, well, right. yeah, I'm repeating it though. For because, a reason. Yeah. <laughs> because my, my reader may have, I mean, this is a chunky book. My reader is probably not reading it all in one sitting. My reader has probably put this down, gone and like looked after their kids and gone and done a whole bunch of stuff. It could be like two weeks later. I want to remind them of what the salient points are. So that when they get to that part, they're not going, now what's happening? Now what, you know, who the heck is this guy? Or who sometimes is who is that Seville? person? Yeah. You know, there might be somebody in my book, there's somebody really important in the beginning who doesn't appear until a really crucial yeah. point toward the end. And you have to somewhere in the middle remind that person is still yeah. out there doing something, you know, so that they, when they get to the point where this guy reappears, it isn't, you know, who's that? And um, that's why I've even gotten to listing the cast of characters that were fictional and um, uh, historical figures being portrayed fictionally, just so people can go back and check, you know, I mean, I, you and I both tend to have a big cast of characters, you know. They're getting bigger. They're getting, yeah, they're getting bigger. bigger I mean, they, were, they were pretty small when I first started out. It was just like, look, there's this little group of people at a hotel. There you go. Boop, you know, um, you know, and now it's just kind of like oh, this whole world now. Look at Cast this. of thousands. All these people. Yeah. Cast of thousands. You let's know, talk. But. Let's talk about your current books a little bit, and then we'll take some questions from our guests. Um, you have both your most recent books are about very courageous, resilient women, which, of course, is wonderful. I'm always a fan of that genre. Um, the Vanished Days is very flashbacks, multi-layered, 
adventure, endurance, romance, um, also a lot about hope and courage. And A Spy Above the Clouds, CG, has so many of those elements as well. It's a very page-turning drama that's ripe with romance and heroic deeds and resilience during a really horrific period of time. So um, either one of you can start, but what um, I'd like you to give our attendees sort of an overview of um, each of your most recent books, what inspired you to write it and just sort of um, what you hope people to take away from it. Oh, it happens. You go first. I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I need okay. time to think. <laughs> I, okay, I will do this off the cuff. It's very hard to do. This is what this yeah. is what your editor will say. So, what are you writing? And you're supposed to like, throw out this nice little like you know thing. And usually we the elevator on. speech. Usually right. we ramble on for about an hour. Yeah. The editor cross crosses eyes and stuff. Um, okay, so the vanished days was a book that grew out of my interest in. Um, a little thing called the Darien Expedition, which I will not get into because I don't want people to miss the ball game because baseball is a big thing in my family, actually. My dad was a first baseman, so can't miss the ball game. Um, but the, um, the Darien Expedition was a, a Scottish, uh, Scotland's attempt to, to found a colony in what is now Panama. Um, and you can Google it and look it up and, and everything you read will be wrong. I will, I will tell you that because it was written by English historians, but you know, if you read my book, you will be corrected. Um, so that there's that. Um, but the, um, I was fascinated by the Darien Expedition because you didn't really hear a lot of it, a lot about it. It was one of those hot huh, things. And, and then I, I have a, a real life character that I've written about in two of my books in The Winter Sea and The Firebird, uh, Colonel uh, Patrick Graham, who was John Murray's uncle in real life, which is, I, I always do genealogy charts myself because I like genealogy. So I always work out a character's family. And when I worked out John Murray's family and saw how everybody was connected, it made perfect sense to me why Colonel Graham was coming back and doing stuff for him. It's like, oh, of course he's his uncle, you know, he's his, and, and I, I could figure out how everybody was connected through that way. Um, but Colonel Graham's son, James, Jamie was, um, was on the Darien expedition and sadly didn't survive. Um, and I knew this from the documents that I had uncovered and, and was dealing with for something completely different. So I thought that was kind of sitting at the back of my head. And I originally had an idea to do this big winds of war type epic novel, you know, back from when, when I was younger, I loved that type of book. You know, the ones that had, had people in all different countries, you know, so you'd have a plot line in New York and a plot line in Panama and a plot line in Scotland, and it would be this big epic story. And that is so not what it turned into. It turned into this completely different book. Um, and I, I really love it more, actually, um, than, than what it would have been. I, um, what it turned into is the story of uh, Sergeant Adam Williamson, who comes home from uh, the continent, comes home to Edinburgh um, after fighting on the continent as a mercenary soldier, and he just wants a little bit of peace. He wants to settle down and find a wife and, and have an ordinary life. Um, he seeks out his former commander, who isn't home, um, and ends up by a, a series of uh, circumstances having to step into his former commander's place as the head of an inquiry into this young widow who has come forward to claim wages that are owed to her husband, James Graham, who perished on the Daring Expedition. Um, and it's Adam's job to find out if she's telling the truth or not. Um, and things just kind of go from there. And as, as the inquiry progresses, we are taken back into Lily's life and uh, so we get the two stories. I love doing dual time stuff. So we, we get the two stories in the one book and just sort of catch up with everything that happened from her life as a, you know, from the time she was young when she first met Jamie. Um, and that takes us through a whole swath of Scotland's history um, through the birth of the Jacobite movement and the whole political upheaval and a bunch of stuff happens. And I now stuff. know, and I now stuff know happens. about the Darien, yes. the Darien mission. Yeah. I mean, I'd never heard of it. I never heard. I of never. It. So well, I, I learned. It, I learned. 
if it hadn't been for the Darien expedition, I can honestly tell you that you would not have had the union between Scotland and England. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's an interesting, significant, very significant thing. thing. More than so a footnote in history. More, more than, than a footnote. footnote. Yeah. 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 Well, for me, um, this was the second in my series. The first was called Landing by Moonlight, which is this guy. And uh, about another woman who stole the naval codes out of the French embassy in DC uh, and compromised a, a, a French embassy official. And she was the first American I found that was recruited to be a, a, a secret agent by the Brits. Um, and a spy above the clouds just totally gripped me when I found out that this woman, the second woman, which became Viv, um, was kind of a playgirl, a spoiled brat um, who'd gone to, who had been sent away to school in Switzerland by very mean kind of just horrible parents. And she was just swanning around Europe as the war came on, but she was a crack skier. And even though she failed every other reason to be a secret agent, she drank too much, she screwed around too much, the Brits needed couriers on skis in the Alps, which was near the Swiss border where lots of you know, stuff was going on with Alan Dulles in Bern as the spy master. And the minute I found out that this woman was a skier, you know, it's funny how one little thing will say, oh my gosh, how many skiers on, you know, spies on skis do you know? And then when I got into her autobiography, which was sketchy, but I learned a lot, I could see, you know, I could see this book about a woman who's really arc of her, it's really a character book, driven book, because her arc became, you know, she was truly a kind of ne'er-do-well playgirl um, with an angry at her mother, her father had died, and her stepfather basically was a German-American conspiring with the Nazis to sell them ball bearings. And she hated that. And she'd seen Germany as a teenager with, with, with the rallies of everybody screaming, just like we've seen in our country the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, and she hated it and she hated him. And she was just so ready. And she loved France because she'd spent a lot of time in France. So when she was recruited, she completely grew up and cared about the things that were important and barely stayed alive as a skier courier taking secret we uh, secret messages and weapons like hand grenades in her backpack skiing down some of the scariest slopes in Europe so to me I, I said it was just irresistible how did she do it what happened to her and the twists and turns of her life and some of them that I gave her at the end um it just capture me so that was basically <clears throat> the story and I got a third one I'm going to do about a woman who saved 80 downed flyers and got them out of France. So these women deserve to have their voices yep. heard just like the women in uh, 17th, 18th century Scotland. We need yep. to know who were they. And their well, stories. both of these books um, are incredibly engaging reads. If you have not read them, I encourage you to do so. And needless to say, we've got both books at our store. So <coughs> um, Susanna's not able to sign in person, but she sent us book plates. And CG, if you are local, can personalize a book for you as well. I'm going to take some really great questions now from our guests. Um, one question, um, and these are sort of for both of you, have either of you ever encountered something during your research that took your story into a completely different direction? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I in this book, actually, um, I was going to set part of it in Darien. I was going to set a chunk of it in Darien. Um, and I discovered, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the book, um, yeah, careful, but careful. <laughs> I will be very careful, but I discovered, uh, something that completely changed my intention to do that. Um, and initially it, it made me think that, okay, well, maybe I will just change that section that I was going to put in dairy and maybe I'll just go to Jamaica instead, you know, um, because part of the, the dairy and expedition uh, survivors ended up going to Darien or to sorry to Jamaica um, uh, and then that that intent that whole thing was crushed as well and, and it was crushed just at the moment 
that I found, there's a wonderful, wonderful Scottish woman uh, named uh, Isabel Murray, who should be remembered by history because the, one of the things that, one of the reasons the Darien expedition failed was because King William sent proclamations down to all the, uh, the colonies, British colonies, including like, you know, all the American colonies, New York and, and New Jersey and every place. Uh, and Jamaica and all the other colonies telling them not to trade with the, with the Darien uh, colonists, the Scottish colonists, the King William did not like the Scots, um, even though they were his subjects. So he was secretly undermining their attempts to set up the colony. Um, and in Jamaica, when the ships came out of the Darien colony, by that time, they were, they were in pretty bad shape, these colonists, they were they hadn't been able to get any support from anybody and they were starving and dying. Um, they, they dropped anchor in, in Bluefields Bay in Jamaica and uh, the governor would not let them off the ships, would not let the men off the ships. And a woman named Isabel Murray said, heck with that. And she marched down and, hmm. and took the wounded, the sick men off the ships and put them up at her, her estate mm. and nursed them. Um, and she should not be forgotten. So it took me a long time to find Isabel Murray because she is not, she's mentioned twice in little history books and she's not recorded anywhere. So I found her finally, just at the moment when I realized I wasn't going to be able to use Jamaica either. Mm. So I was like, <laughs> darn it, because I found her. I knew exactly where she lived. <laughs> Ah, That's so I was great. mad. That was mad. But yeah, so that was a big, that took the whole book in a completely different direction that I had never expected it to go in. Yes. Okay. Okay. Another, I had, oh, I go had on, some weird little thing happen, you know, on this, on this last book was I thought I knew how it was going to end. And about six months before I fin finished a draft, I, I, somebody sent me a clipping, thank goodness for your friends, um, about a, a doctor in another ski resort who had hid um, Jews and uh, refugees and down pilots in his attic. It was just a little thing. And the woman uh, lived in San Francisco. So it was a story about her survival, thanks to this doctor. And I needed him in order to make this thing work. And it just literally dropped into my lap just at the moment that I needed. And my writer father used to say, well, just put it down in your deep subconscious that you need to solve this prop, plot problem, you know? And sure enough, somebody sent me this article. So you never know. Okay, another question. What do our authors think of the fictional twin trope like Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper or Dumas's The Man in the Iron Mask? Good stories. Yes. I think any any trope is is doable if you put your own mark on it and do it well. I don't think there's anything that can necessarily make a I, I don't turn my nose up at anything that you know every writer can write what they you know choose to write. And also, I tropes, think right? an editor once said to me, I was in the middle of a nonfiction book, one of my, my very first book. I had written a magazine story and it sold to Viking as a, a story about joint custody of children. And I was working away and I was a reporter. I wasn't a shrink. I wasn't an expert in children or anything. And this other book was coming out and I was just heart set. And the, and the editor said, now stop it. He said, no one can write the book on any subject that you can't. People can write on that subject, but it's your vision. So just keep typing. And it was the best thing in the world. There's no, you know, you can make anything work if you're good yeah. enough. Okay, one last question here. Um, how long do you feel you need to wait before writing about real people whose behaviors you could only portray honestly and whose behavior you find reprehensible? Hmm. And that kind of the twin question with that is, do you consider the feelings of family members related to people who would be characters, especially negative ones, even if the people you're writing about are deceased? Yes. Good question. Yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. Mm -hmm. um, because they're people. Um, you're holding 
you're holding lives in your hands as a writer when you're writing about real people. They're people. Um, it's a responsibility you have. Um, the the guiding person I carry in the back of my head is um, Olivia de Havilland, um, who came out of her her seclusion to tell the world that she would never have called her sister a bitch. Right. I mean, it was important enough to her to come out of that, you know, to say that. privacy, to just say, I would never have, have used that word in relation to my sister. Um, and she fought a lawsuit over it. I mean, she lost, but, but it was important enough to her to do that. And I try to always remember that when I'm writing real people, mm -hmm. that they were important to somebody. They, they were loved by somebody. They were real and they breathed and they deserve my respect. Um, even the rat bastards. So, you know, the, if I'm going to use a real person in a less than shiny role, I better be darn sure mm -hmm. that the words I'm putting in their mouth are either their own words right. or words that I know beyond, beyond doubt are words that they would have, could have said. Um, exactly. It, you know, I think, sorry, I, I was no, just go ahead because I know we're close on time, but, um, yep. you know, Hitler, you know, I had to deal with Hitler. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to, you know, worry about what his descendants yep. think about him. Yep. Um, because people, yep. on the other hand, as a reporter, I ran into this. When you were really telling a story that was true and you had the facts, people only want to be described in the noblest of terms. And there are times where you have to call it as it is. Yep. But as Susanna said, you better have your facts right. Yep. And if you're going to do that, and I, even the Duchess of Gordon, believe it or not, her, the man who owned her house was a little upset with me because of the way um, she had seven kids and she had one child not by the Duke. And he didn't like that, that that was revealed. Now she lived 220 years earlier. And I'm, but for me to tell the story, it was true and there was good evidence for it. And so I did it. So you have to be ready for the for the pushback too mm -hmm. but i think that's what Susanna's saying you have to remember who they were and be sure you got your facts right be sure you and, got your facts and right. say it yep. fairly say it yep. fairly. well and also also just you know like you're asking how long you want to wait right you know it, i'm not sure i'd use somebody super well, I write historical so i wouldn't use somebody super recent anyway that's time. why we write but historical. That's why we write historical. <laughs> that's but, why it's called historical. Yeah. That's why it's called historical. But mm -hmm. you know, just if you're thinking of someone that, you know, that recent, fictionalize them. Mm -hmm. Look how you know. Truman Capote got in so much trouble when he wrote about all his best friends. And yeah. there's, there's now a new book about that. Yeah. You know, did not go down well. You know. Tried okay, carefully. Well, yeah. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to end on a couple wonderful little comments here. Vicki Carter says, what a wonderful webinar. I love you both and I've read all of your books, mm -hmm. both of you. My oh. question, she's got two questions. Do you write for yourself or for the reader during the writing process? I write a story that fascinates me and intrigues me enough to spend 18 to months to three years on a book, but I try to keep my reader in mind. I, I want them not to get bored or to get overwhelmed. You know, it's that balance we were talking about before. I, I got us both in mind. All right, for the story, um, I write what this, where the story takes me because I can't do anything else. And I'm never gonna please every reader. Right. Um, and I have to always remember that. And I, I love my readers. I do love my readers. But if you spread out all my readers, there are going to be some that want me to write another book like Mariana and not so much a book like The Vanished Days and some that want me to write more Vanished Days and not so much a book like The Rose Garden and some that like this book better. Like Just like Mary Stewart is my favorite author of all time. And I love her early mysteries and I don't like her later ones. And I love, you know, Touch Not the Cat, but I don't like the Arthurian books. And I have favorites among her books, you know, and, and it's completely natural for a reader to be that way with my books too. I Some agree. people are going to pick up one of my books and go, Ugh, you know, yeah. like, I don't like that one. That's not my favorite. And that's totally mm -hmm. okay. And if I try to worry about pleasing 
all the readers all the time with every story I tell, I would, I would be, you know, I'm sad when I don't, I'm, I'm legitimately sad. That's why I don't read reviews. I don't because, either. Because I don't either. It oh. really makes me sad if I, you know, if I read something and I've disappointed a reader. Yeah. But the, the reviews are not for me. The reviews are for readers talking to each other. Right. To decide not, whether they want to spend yeah, money on you. So you. I shouldn't be reading them anyway, but I write the story the way the story comes to me. And I have to be true to the characters in the story. And I can only write what I get and follow it where it goes. And, you know, that's, that's what I do. And if they don't like this one, they can just hope that the next one will be more to their liking. So that's all I can do. One last question for you, Susanna, um, from Vicki. Uh, how long does it take you to finish a book and still take care of your responsibility with family? How oh. many hours a day do you write? Let's talk I, about that for an hour. Yeah, we can talk. Well, no, actually, we can talk. We can, we'll both be different on that, too, because um, yeah. I've, got, I've got two boys. Um, uh, now they're older now. They're both at university. One's at home going to university and one's in Estonia going to university. And the, um, so, but at different times of my life, I mean, obviously when the kids were younger, it was harder to carve out that writing time because then there are different days when family comes first. There's still different days when family comes first. With the pandemic, everybody, you know, was in my, my space all of a sudden. It's like, ah, um, I don't write every day. Um, because not all days are writing days. Some days are, are yes, you know, and, and taking care of your taxes and doing other stuff and, uh, you know, working on other things and, or doing research or, or just sitting down and reading somebody else's book. Um, so not all days are writing days, but uh, when I'm in the thick of the writing, at the, in the middle of a book, I'll be writing maybe three hours would be an average writing lump of time for me um and then I start uh getting squirrel type things like where I get easily distracted I'm kind of like oh yeah yeah you know like I, I, I but as I get towards the end of the book then I get super laser focused and I don't want to come out of it and it's hard for people to to pull me out of it because I'm so deeply into that world that I almost forget to come out for I, I wrote the end of Bellwether when I was in Scotland in actually in the place where I set the vanished days, I was in that same house where I set the vanished days, staying in a holiday flat. And I was, I wrote the last part of Bellwether while eating chocolate croissants and drinking whiskey. And that was all I did for like that week was just like chocolate croissants, whiskey and coffee and just write, 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 write and never came out. And yeah, that was kind of fun actually. But you know, that was, so it depends on where I am in the book, but most books take me anywhere from the quickest I've written one is one year, The Winter Sea, um, and Mariana both took me one year. The longest has been about four years, and I never know until I get into them because I don't have one. So, I don't know if you want to know my answer, but it's a little different. Um, I've had that same timeline. I've done things in just a little bit more than a year, and then one that took four, almost five years. To do. Right. Um, but you know, I'm the daughter of a writer, and I had a bedroom opposite my father's workroom, and he would be there at five a.m. pounding his typewriter, and then he'd break for breakfast, break for lunch. I'd come home from school; he's just finishing his work. So for me, it was like, oh. It's an eight hour day job when you're writing and it's so bizarre, but when I'm working, you know, I can go long hours uh, at my computer, I, my back hurts and my tush hurts, you know, but, um, it, you know, I, I have just been in, in a different frame my whole life, even though that was before when I was a broadcaster, I was like you, I had to do whatever I did on the day and then I had a small child who's now way older and has three kids himself so now I'm preoccupied with my grandchildren but I really um in the last maybe 15 years where I've been able to really focus I have been much more productive you know because I do have this dad said that's kind of like working for the telephone company you punch in and you punch out that was just he'd been a reporter also so it's just the milieu you grow up in you know and he said yeah. I don't have time for writer's block I gotta put you guys through college so it was a different approach, I think. And either way, it works. We've produced. 
almost and it's, number of books. And it's a it's 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 funny because when I wrote um, one of my books, Name to the Dragon, I was I was doing nothing else. I had no kids. I was not married. I lived in the house I was writing about, and I thought this is it. This is great. I've got all day. I can write all day. No distractions. No nothing. Still wrote the same three hours. Spent the rest of the time putzing around walking places petting people's horses like I was just you know it, it, it's still my brain just seems to do that that thing and then the rest of the time I'm like squirrel rabbit you know whatever it, it's it's just it's, it's how we're calibrated be, and it's how I'm wired right yeah. and you know and to, in fairness I have no door in my writing room mm. and everybody and their brother walks in like you know my husband will walk in going is it coffee time yet can we have coffee and so so you know like it, it's it it just well, it's, it's funny because I happened. learned to write in a newsroom where people were screaming epithets at each other and it was like a nightmare all the time and you had to just look and get your job done. So oh, I envy you. Know, we I learn envy how you. to do it. Yeah, I have to have, if, if I have people talking, I have to have these in with white noise on. So, you know, I just, I need the silence. I'm just, well, however you both do it, keep doing it because the results are phenomenal. <laughs> Whatever your thank style, you. your technique, um, keep doing it because it's wonderful. Thank you, CG. Thank you, Susanna. Well, thank Thanks you. to everyone who joined us. Um, thank you, everybody. We so much. Welcome thank you, you Carol. Oh, so uh, well, this is, uh, we love hosting authors and um, as much as I love doing live events, it's great that we're able to connect with people on the other side of the country via Zoom. And thank you so much for joining us all that way, Susanna. Okay. And we thank look forward you. to well, seeing you. I hope so. And, Susanna. Well, I will definitely. And my my mom used to own an independent bookstore when I was a little girl. So she oh. made absolutely no profit because my sister and I would get to all the books first before she unpacked them. And we would, we have these great, like I have a full, hardcover set of Anne of Green Gables books and my mom made no profit but I um, but I, I remember I that, that feeling so <laughs> so what I do want to encourage everybody that is here watching is that you know if you're some people will have already bought my book some people will have already bought CG's book you know just buy somebody else's book even from Sausalito Books on the Bay just just give them some love give them some support for supporting us um, it's, it's very difficult to be an independent bookstore at the best of times. It's really difficult to be an independent bookstore in the middle of a pandemic and to have these wonderful events and to have the, the love and support of an independent bookstore is something that, that I never take for granted as a, as a, a writer and just, you know, just the littlest thing they will ship to you. Um, we ship for free. They ship, for, ship free. for free. You know, I have so. to tell you, Susanna, she, I don't know how. Cheryl did it. She physically, with her mask and her plastic shield, would drive to people's houses. I saw the, the sign. I thought and it was deliver awesome. the book to their mailbox and then text them saying it's here and I had my gloves on. You know, she was yep. amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So, so support you know, your independent bookstore wherever support you your are. Independent support bookstore. your independent bookstore and uh, keep reading, everyone. Thank you so so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thanks for coming.